Thanks so much um, for having me here today. I have to say, I have no idea what time it is right now. Um, my body thinks it's about 2.30 in the morning. Uh, the clock says that it's 9.30, but the sun just rose, and it's going to set in like an hour. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm apparently just going to stay perpetually confused about what time it is, where I am, or, or anything like that. But I'm, I'm incredibly glad uh, to be here today. Um, I am, uh, I'm less glad about not getting a more recent headshot of myself uh, to the organizers of this thing. Uh, clearly, we're about uh, 12 inches or so off from, from the photo that, that I gave everyone. Uh, so I really do apologize if you were expecting a more reasonable length beard. Um, today. Uh, it is a little bit better than the, the photo on my passport, which um, <laughs> I'm kind of amazed has not created an international incident at this point. Um, the customs agent yesterday uh, was incredibly skeptical. <laughs> looked, at a, looked at my photo, looked at me, looked at my photo, looked at me, and finally shrugged and said, well, it's no shave November, and stamped me and, uh, and let me in. So. Uh, it really is wonderful to be allowed into Sweden uh, and, to be, and to be here in Stockholm uh, with you today. Um, this is my second time in Stockholm. Uh, the last was in a, an entirely different lifetime, it's about 15 years ago. And oddly enough, I was invited for a different talk. Uh, this was at the Lava Youth Center, which was at the Culture House just down the street. Uh, I don't know, is, is Lava still around or is that? Yes? Awesome. Um, the talk I was invited to do was, was uh, to, quote, inspire the Swedish zine maker. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with, with the term zine, these are kind of independently produced magazines, uh, often quite small, photocopied. Uh, they were really kind of blogs before there was blogging, or Twitter before 140 characters was a design constraint. Or, uh, you know, they were a social network, essentially, uh, spread through the mail or through in-person kind of swaps, uh, based around sharing ideas and information and, and art. The zine I published, the reason I was invited here, was called Punk Planet. It was a little bigger, a little more polished than, than many zines, but it was still very much a part of the culture and community that made up the zine world and the punk uh, scene of the 1990s and, and 2000s. It's hard to describe now, here in this just heavily networked present that we occupy, what it was like to get a zine handed to you from someone that you met because she was roadieing for a band that played in your friend's basement um, without sounding like you're describing some kind of ancient fictional history. Uh, but this world and, and, and running this magazine, that's actually our last issue, and that's a stack of all 80 of them. Uh, there on the cover. This taught me everything I know about building. It taught me everything I know about community and everything I know about collaboration. And this was a group of people that cared deeply about their values. Right? And these were the values of the staunchly independent kind of do-it-yourself ethos of the 90s. And they wanted not to share it with the world but to share it with others that would really truly appreciate it. This was at its height around the world, a tiny culture. I remember at one point, uh, a guy who ran a record label asked me, you know, how many subscribers do you have? And um, at the time, we had maybe 12 or 13,000. And he said, you know, that's the population of a small town. Why don't we all just move there? And uh, it's, it's actually a very romantic notion that I still try to do. Uh, I actually tried to get a bunch of people on Twitter to pool money to buy a town just a, just a couple of months ago. Uh, but we didn't. Uh, by that town, and, and we certainly didn't as, as a bunch of punks moved to a town. And that era of indie music and media uh, really came to an end as the rise of the MP3 kind of ate the music industry. Uh, Punk Planet ended in 2007. Uh, jump forward a decade, and here I am now, not inspiring the, zine, the Swedish zine maker, but instead uh, talking about the internet. Because the internet is where I and where probably all of you find our inspiration now. The world has gotten so much bigger than when 12,000 punks could have moved to a small town. And yet here I am, again in Sweden, giving a talk to people that are here for the same basic reasons. 
we love a thing. Like literally, hearts are your iconography here. It's amazing. And we love a thing and we want to keep it vital. The work I do now is uh, really quite different. Uh, I run a project called Night Mozilla Open News. We work with people writing code in journalism to help them to collaborate and document and share their work. But it's also very much the same work. We help to foster a community that cares passionately about the work it does, the impact it has, and the collaboration it fosters. That this work is performing acts of journalism through code and not through a reporter's notebook means that our community plays a crucial role in creating journalism that's not simply on the web, but of the web. This is not a huge community, uh, and it's one that has a great deal of external pressures on it. Right? Journalism is not exactly an industry that makes it easy for a developer to stick around when Silicon Valley is flashing cash every, every three minutes. And so giving people a sense that they belong, that they have colleagues and collaborators, that they can get help and solve problems together, it's really important. And so we help to build this community. We convene them in small groups we call code convenings to open source code that happens in the newsroom. We bring them together in, larger, in a larger scale conference called SourceCon, which now sells out in seconds every year. And we bring people in through a fellowship program. These are actually our brand new uh, fellows that we just announced two weeks ago at the Mozilla Festival. Ultimately, we help to make connections the way that you always have, one person, at a time. Which brings us to today. We're here today obviously to talk about the internet and the window that it offers into the world that we live in. And I want to talk about journalism on the web and the current era it finds itself in and the impact that that era is having on the whole of the web. And now most eras move in slowly, right? There's an innovation here, a change there, and suddenly you're somewhere else. You can't really point to any one thing that led you there, but you're suddenly in a place that's, that's very different. And today's internet can feel like that. Right? We've moved from a wide open, anything goes web, to one that's far more closed, largely cordoned off by enormous companies worth many billions of dollars, fighting tooth and nail to dominate the whole of the web. And it can feel like we got here in that same kind of way where you suddenly turn around and you wonder, well, when did this happen? Except it's not true. This new era of the web that we're in, that of essentially a web of feudal city-states, can actually be traced to mid-October 2013. Uh, this is when many web publishers started to notice something super weird. Facebook was suddenly driving tons and tons of traffic to their site. This is literally from September to October. Suddenly it was like, what is going on? And this wasn't just to new pieces, right? This wasn't just sort of, oh, we had a, you know, some big news event happened and suddenly everyone came. Multiple publishers in October of 2013 suddenly discovered that the most trafficked piece to their site was two, three years old. They had no idea what was going on. It really felt incredibly random. And that most bizarrely, this was from a platform that really was not considered to be a major driver of news back in, in 2013. You know, back in 2013, it was Twitter and not Facebook that was really seen as the kind of news social media. And yet suddenly here was traffic, and it just kept growing. There's a fascinating story written just two months later, December 2013, uh, by Robinson Mayer at The Atlantic. Um, he's writing this story in real time, right? He's writing this story trying to make sense of this sudden increase in traffic. Um, and it's a fascinating read. I urge everyone at some point to go back and read it because he makes predictions. He basically says, well, if this sticks around, what is this going to look like? And he gets so much more right than he gets wrong. Um, it's really quite amazing. But the most striking thing about this article, and again, it's, it's hard to... This is an article that was written as these events were unfolding. Everyone in it basically says the same thing. They say, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> we don't know why these pieces are getting highlighted. We have no clue what changed. But oh my God, we love it, right? And please just keep on coming. And it has. This is uh, 
social media traffic referrals, and you can see that big spike. That's October 2013. And Facebook just takes off from there. Month after month, traffic has grown to news sites from Facebook. And Facebook has gone from being just one of a concert of, of things that drive traffic to sites to the most dominant. And yet, most publishers still don't know what's happening or why. Right? Facebook's decisions are a black box. And so people kind of try to figure out what's working and then uh, see if it continues to work. And, and the strangest thing about this, uh, about Facebook, is that it, what worked one month suddenly won't uh, work the next. Robinson's article is written in the context of Upworthy, which uh, you may remember, I don't know if you go to anymore. It, 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 there was a moment where it felt unstoppable, right? If, you, if you're used to the internet uh, headline convention of you won't believe what happens next, right? Upworthy figured it out. Uh, it's called the Curiosity Gap, and they basically were the first site to really weaponize it. Um, they rode this change in Facebook to the top. Uh, the winter of 2013, spring of 2014, they were really unstoppable. Um, and now they're just sort of a footnote. They're, they're the first to figure this out. Um, and the reason that they're a footnote is because ultimately they figured out an, uh, an exploit to an algorithm. Right? Not a business plan. And Facebook was able to optimize that exploit right out of the newsfeed. And so now we see Upworthy as much more of a cautionary tale. And yet publishers over and over and over again keep trying to be the next Upworthy. What they want is that traffic. And Facebook supplied it in droves. In fact, Facebook has now overtaken Google as the main traffic source for news. This is just unfathomable uh, just a couple of years ago. This is a huge, huge change. And Facebook and the way it promotes these, these, this traffic and, and these articles has become more and more important to the economy of, of journalism. That is until this January. Uh, a number of recent stories have basically said this spigot is turning off, right? Uh, this article says, you know, things fell 32%. Uh, some publishers saw 40 up to 50%, and that's continued, right? And this article is super interesting because just like that article from The Atlantic two years ago, everyone's saying, we don't know what happened. It's a total mystery, right? Facebook giveth and Facebook taketh away. And while we may not know the intricacies of the algorithm, we do know that Facebook's business has changed massively in the last two years. Now, back in the summer of 2013, Facebook basically operated like the web, right? Uh, beyond the baby photos and internet memes and status updates from your racist uncle, um, Facebook was tons and tons and tons of links. Right? And that's how the web worked. It's interconnected. But something happened beyond that algorithm tweak in October, actually. In about December of 2013, Facebook introduces auto-playing Facebook videos. Right? And these change everything with Facebook. Um, it basically, over the course of 2014, erased YouTube's presence from Facebook. YouTube went from being about 90% of all videos shared on Facebook to somewhere around 10 to 15%. Um, and the message that Facebook learned from this was super clear, right? Just keep them in the stream. Keep them there, keep it unavoidable, and people stick around. After the victory of Facebook video, Sending millions of people away to sites where those news links originated doesn't make a lot of business sense. Lay on top of that that a lot of that traffic was mobile, right? And they were hitting the absolute awful user experience of most news mobile sites. And you've got a problem that was ripe for solving. That solution debuted this year in the form of something called Facebook Instant Articles. Instead of sending users out to read stories, Facebook now brings those stories into Facebook. On the surface, this feels like a win-win, right? Facebook keeps people in. Readers don't suffer through publishers' mobile gauntlet. 
So it seems like that uh, natural extension that of course we'd see traffic from Facebook drop, right? They have an internal system now for publishing stories. Why wouldn't they start to depreciate external links? Now, for publishers that are part of Instant Articles, this is, this is great. This is an enormous opportunity. But it's especially enormous for Facebook, right? They reap all the benefits while only having to give out a tiny bit of the reward. But this is what the web looks like. And this is what this new Facebook looks like. For the open web, this is not so great, right? This is a design pattern that breaks the entire concept of the web. Because now the incentives aren't around linking out, but instead they're around keeping people in. This is not the design pattern of the web. This is the design pattern of a casino, right? which are built around the in, uh, to minute detail around keeping people in, keeping people pulling that slot machine, you know, keeping people hoping that they're going to hit that jackpot next time. And like a casino, the house always wins. Perhaps if this was a story of just the evolution of Facebook over the last two years, it would have less impact on the overall web. But Facebook's many victories have come at a cost to the other quasi-monopolies that exist in tech. And so now you're seeing replications of this casino design. Apple News promises to bring a casino to your phone, right? Twitter casinoed out moments when they stripped external links out of the tweets that they bundle. Through a project called AMP, Google essentially wants to fork HTML and create a casino around the entire mobile web. All of these casinos are being billed as solutions for largely self-inflicted wounds of journalism. Um, they certainly do offer a superior mobile experience and audience in vast, really unheard numbers. And so that siren song is super alluring, right? Come, give us your content, and we'll give you more people than you can possibly handle. And yet, I can't help but think that these solutions, which boil journalism down to nothing more than text and image and video, are moving everything in the wrong direction. You know, for all the headlines around the death of news, the reality is that the last decade has seen huge leaps forward in what true web native journalism looks like. We've seen radical rethinking of presentation, groundbreaking interactives, huge strides in data visualization, and genre-bending experimentation. And none of it, zero, works in these new solutions that are being offered by the various internet giants. They are literally not supported. You have to deliver nothing but text and image into these, into these systems. It's as if the people that are offering to solve journalism's problems haven't been paying attention to how well many news organizations have actually been doing and pushing things forward. But that promise of endless traffic is so tempting, and so we're beginning to see the migration away from the innovation and gains of today. Losing those gains is going to be a real loss, not only to journalism, but to the web itself. Because quietly and without a lot of fanfare over the last decade, the speed and the rigor of the newsroom has proven time and again that it is an excellent testing ground for web tools. Django, Backbone, Underscore, D3, these are all tools that got their start or were heavily incubated in newsrooms. And these are tools that help to define how the modern open web is built. These are powerful open source tools bringing open information out into the open web. It's rare that any of these innovations, any of these tools, any of these technologies are simply about text and images or straight video, which is the confining definition of journalism put forward by Facebook, by Apple, and by others. I mean, really, these definitions are the technologies of last century. They are not the technologies of today. And so we're losing the vital reimagining of journalism. We're losing what it should be when it's made today. 
all of this innovation, all this information, all of this vital work in helping to understand how the world works, this goes away in the instant article, Apple News, Google AMP reality. We seed our information, we seed our information, we seed our inability to innovate, we seed our inability to disseminate that information, we hand it over willingly in the name of enormous audience. I labored for a really long time writing this talk. Um, I'll actually be honest, I, I wrote a draft and then I wrote three other talks and then finally came back to this draft very late in the game. My struggle was really this. I like to talk about hope. And it's hard to find hope here. You know, there are literal giants battling for dominance of the web right now. And me and you and everyone could just wind up collateral damage from this. And it could very well be that the open web as we know it is coming to an end. There's not a lot of hope in it. Except, I really hope that actually says except. <laughs> 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 could just say, fuck you, I have no idea. Uh, except, except I think people are pretty incredible. And every community I've ever been a part of is astounding in its resiliency. You know, punk rock grew out of the frustration of the state of mainstream media. I'm sorry, the, the state of mainstream music. It's just kids that didn't know how to play guitars. And they ended up changing the world. And all of that journalism innovation uh, grew out of the frustration of the state of, of mainstream news. You know, these were just folks, people already in the newsroom, hacking together new ideas. And those ideas ended up changing the world and ended up changing the web. You know, today, it feels like there's only one scale, right? this massive web scale. There's only one type of growth allowed, this kind of hockey stick VC funded growth. There's only one way to build a company with millions of dollars of investment at billions of dollar valuation. And yet look at the heaping pile of garbage that is this web scale internet. It's become a web of a few massive companies, each creating closed spaces that consolidate their audience. They don't spread it across the web as a whole. It's become less open than it was even just a few short years ago. It has less opportunity for experimentation, for that kind of odd and unusual that really defined the way the web grew. Maybe chasing VC dollars and the scale that they require wasn't the best idea. You know, in the pursuit of that massive money, we left so much by the side of the road. We ignored people and craft and community. And so here we are now, awash in this crap web scale internet. We have a web that's less open, less interconnected, and less full of possibility than it should be. What we see in the instant artif articleification of the web is the end game of web scale. The only audience that matters is the biggest audience possible. And so lock them in and keep them in. But biggest is super uninteresting. People get cool when their numbers are not infinity. We don't have to play this game of web scale. We can declare scale bankruptcy. Let's start over and let's build in the rubble of the giant's battles. You know, let's build stuff for 100 people. Let's build things for 1,000 people. Not every idea has to scale. Not everything you build has to become a business. You can build for fun. You can hack together stupid shit, right? You can learn something new and then teach it to someone else. And that's where it gets really exciting. You build and you share and you build and you share. And piece by piece, one by one, 
we create a better web. This is how change happens. It happens person by person, one by one. It happens in rooms like this. It happens with the people that you don't know that you're sitting next to right now. A better web is possible. A web that is about people again. A web that's about building together. A web that's about community. This is still something we can do despite the massive things happening outside. We do what we always do. We build around the edges. Right? And we build up something new. So let's do that. You know, today's the day we start. And let's build that new web together. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed. Um, I think what I will take with me from today is the house always wins. <laughs> um, if the house always wins, how do we gather the like, magic number of punks we need <laughs> to overthrow the casino? Is there, is there a good way to network that lets us build stupid shit together that takes it outside of Facebook and Google all these giants. What, what are we doing? How can we do this? You turn to the person sitting next to you and you introduce yourself, right? And you say what you do and they say what they do and, and you say what's exciting to you and they say what's exciting to them and, and you just start, right? You, you don't start by saying we're going to take down the house, right? It just doesn't work that way, you know? I mean, it works in Ocean's Eleven, right? Mm -hmm. That was 11 people, so maybe that's what we need, right? <laughs> 11 people. Um, but it starts small, right? And, and, and it grows from there. But, you know, if you start with the end goal of we're, we're taking down giants, you never get there, right? You just start with what is right in front of you, which is people, and you build together. Do you think maybe part of the problem is that the young generation of internet doers today are dreaming of the big payoff, dreaming of the IPO, dreaming of selling out and making money, instead of like maybe the original generation, the original builders of the web, wanted to make something for a better future? Kids, and how do we change the kids' days. attitude? Um, you have all I, the answers, I, right? Yeah, just, yeah. I, I, I don't think we do, right? I mean, the, the allure of money and the allure of scale is not new, right? Um, the, you know, the want to kind of cash out and sell out, that's always been there. And there have always been people, especially young people, that sit and stare and point and go, that's bullshit, right? So I don't think that has gone away. It's just a lot harder to see now. You yeah. know, one of the things that's it's hard about it not being 12,000 punks in the entire world and instead being billions of people across the internet is it's very hard to then go, oh wait, but 12,000 people matter too, right? Or 100 people matter too, or three people matter too. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we have to reshift that thinking. Thank you. And speaking of building stupid shit together, <laughs> uh, of course we have another clock. Uh, or this is going to be amazing in US customs. Yes, they're going to love it. They're going to uh, just be yes. so thrilled. But at least, uh, at least you can uh, show wow. them how it works and tell them that the president loves it. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Sinker. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. <laughs>